Welcome, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce the uh, 29th uh, Miriam Lemberg uh, lecture. Uh, we're very pleased to have um, uh, Paula Saltzman and her family on the, uh, on the lecture as well. Paula's Miriam's uh, daughter. Um, just to give quickly the history of this uh, lectureship, um, uh, my name is Joshua Hare. I'm the Lewis Lemberg um, Professor of Medicine. Um, while Miriam was uh, secretly raising the funds for the, the Lewis Lemberg uh, chair in her husband's name, he was secretly raising the funds for this lectureship in her name. So this has been a, a very uh, important part of our academic life here at the uh, Miller School of Medicine now for 29 years. We're very thrilled uh, to have um, uh, Dr. Jim Fang as our speaker who will be introduced um, subsequently. Okay, so I'll go ahead. Dr. James Fang is the Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine at the University of Utah School of Medicine and Director of the Cardiovascular Service Line at the University of Utah Healthcare. He holds the John and June B. Hartman Presidential Endowed Chair and is Professor of Medicine at the University of Utah School of Medicine. Dr. Fang attended undergraduate in medical school at, the, at Duke University. He completed his internship residency and chief residency at John, Johns Hopkins Hospital. He completed his cardiovascular and heart failure transplant fellowships at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He then became faculty at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School until 2006. He served as associate professor of medicine, medical director of the heart transplant program, as well as the program director of the cardiovascular fellowship training program during his tenure there. He was then recruited to Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland as Clinical Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine and Associate Chief for Clinical Affairs, Medical Director of the Heart Failure Transplant and Circulatory Assist Program, and Chief Medical Officer for the Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute. In 2013, he assumed the role of Chief Car of Cardiovascular Medicine at the University of Utah and Executive Director of the University of Utah Health's Cardiovascular Service Line. He's the author of more than 175 original articles, editorials, and book chapters, and he has been part of a number of important cardiovascular research groups and collaborations. He has special interest in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, advanced heart failure, coronary artery vasculopathy of the transplanted heart, and the cardiorenal syndrome. He has also led several position statements for the Heart Failure Society of America, as well as the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation. He currently serves as the ACC AHA Heart Failure Guideline Committee and on the board of directors of the Heart Failure Society of America. He was elected to the Association of University Cardiologists in 2013 and is a member of the Executive Committee of the Association of Professors of Cardiology. So with that, please welcome Dr. Fang. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Morrison, um, for that introduction. And uh, I really want to also thank the Lemberg family. This is a really wonderful honor to be invited uh, to speak um, at the University of Miami and uh, in tribute to uh, Dr. Lemberg and his family. And I, of course, want to give a shout out to my good friend, Dr. Hare, who I've known since 1988, uh, as he probably will recall. So I appreciate his invitation, Dr. Weiss's invitation and Dr. Goldberger's invitation. So um, over the next 50, 55 minutes, I hope to convince you that uh, perhaps we've been looking at this condition called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction from the wrong lens. Um, and it might be a bit curious to have a cardiologist talk so much about the kidney, but I can tell you in our daily practices, uh, it is one of our greatest challenges. And so the title of this talk is HEFPEF as a Renal Cardiac Disorder. Um, let me see if I can get my slides to advance. Uh, here we go. Here are my disclosures. Well, this audience uh, probably uh, doesn't need to hear much about the epidemiology since uh, almost everybody on this call, I'm sure, uh, deals with this patient population uh, on a daily, if not a weekly basis. So it's a condition that appears to be increasing in prevalence. It's a disease um, of aging uh, within a population that's aging. The diagnosis, frankly, can be challenging. Not everybody who's short of breath uh, with a normal ejection fraction has this condition, and uh, we might talk a little bit about that at the end. And then I think we need to recognize that this is an important condition um, with respect to morbidity and mortality. 
when Dr. Hare and I in 1988 uh, were interns at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, we were told that diastolic heart failure is a condition that uh, is more of a nuisance um, um, than a, uh, a serious illness. And of course, I think we've uh, had a big change uh, in perspective over the years. And uh, this, uh, this condition, of course, that we've known about for some time uh, has stood the test of time in terms of uh, trying to find solutions. Uh, we have unfortunately not found uh, many solutions. This is a timeline of uh, HEFPEF trials. Um, above the line are trials that would be positive, uh, trials in the middle would be neutral, and trials at the very bottom of this graph would be, uh, frankly, negative or harmful. As you can see, over some 20 years, we have tried, frankly, it seems like almost everything. And as you can see, um, these trials generally fall below this line. And I've also highlighted just four recent trials that have got at this issue that have tested things like inorganic nitrates and adenosine agonists. Now, we will talk a little bit about Secupitrel Valsartan. Uh, many of you recognize that because of the results of the Paragon trial, the FDA recently approved this for the management of patients um, with low normal ejection fractions within the world of HEFPEF. And uh, this condition, of course, because we've had limited therapies, um, uh, uh, has been a struggle for guideline committees. These are the most current guidelines, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner from 2017, not that long ago. And I'd like to point you to this uh, set of recommendations for HEFPEF. Uh, number one is that there's only two um, recommendations that are considered level one. And, and these two conditions uh, state that you should treat hypertension and use diuretics. Uh, number two, that most of the other recommendations are considered level of evidence C there in the middle. And number three, these were simply cut and pasted <laughs> from 2013. The additions in the guidelines in 2017 included these three new recommendations. And as you can see, these again uh, were not uh, earth shattering. Uh, number one, it suggested that uh, patients with uh, HEFPEF might benefit from MRAs, such as spironolactone. Number two, to avoid certain things, but it's been shown to be harmful. Harmful, And number three, potentially introduced a blood pressure target on the results of SPRINT. But again, nothing earth shattering here. So you, you got to sit back for a moment and ask yourself, why do we keep failing in this condition of heart failure? Have we picked the wrong patients? Um, we've talked a little bit about sometimes the challenge of making this diagnosis. Perhaps we've been putting the wrong patients into these trials. Number two, have we been simply just trying the wrong drugs? Maybe we need to get a little away from the notion of heart failure per se as a disease of neurohormonal activation, uh, stimulation, uh, and rage. And maybe we need to bark up a never tree. Uh, or three, have we been looking at the wrong endpoints? Again, when we look at um, uh, cardiovascular trials, we tend to measure uh, cardiovascular death and uh, cardiovascular morbidities. But isn't it all-cause mortality that we're really interested in at the end of the day? Um, and then, of course, which is the topic uh, at hand in this talk, is perhaps we have been barking up the wrong tree and that we've been too cardiac-centric and we need to consider other perspectives. Now, of course, another perspective to have PEF uh, really has been, um, I would say, embraced. Uh, and this other perspective um, considers the fact that perhaps HEFPEF is not a disease, but perhaps simply a condition um, uh, and a syndrome. And that within this condition or syndrome, there's a tremendous heterogeneity. And if we could figure out um, the nature of these various subsets, perhaps we could direct our therapies to these subsets. And Sanjeev Shah at Northwestern introduced this idea using machine learning by deeply phenotyping a group of 550 roughly patients from the Northwestern HEFPEF uh, clinic. Uh, and using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, teased out um, specific groups that segregated according to outcome, as you can see here. And there were clinical characteristics that were associated with these outcomes. And as many of you know on the call, this is the current thinking in HEFPEF, that this is really a grab bag diagnosis and that most of our efforts are now spent in trying to really tease out who these subgroups are and perhaps find mechanistically the silver bullet that underlies each one of these conditions.
Um, but I do think there's another perspective that we should consider and rethink. And uh, for those of you who are Robin Williams lovers, I, I love this particular um, photograph, uh, which means that depending upon um, your perspective, you may have a very different thinking um, about the issue. And this is where my discussion today really revolves around, and, and that is the issue of congestion. Now, I started thinking about this a long time ago, um, and this really grew out of not so much half PEF, but as we'll talk about later today at Cardiovascular Grand Rounds, this issue of heart failure with recovered ejection fraction. As you can see, I'd like you to concentrate on the right graph. And on the right graph, you can see in green here that in patients who have recovered, uh, who have recovery and ejection fraction, arguably a normal stroke volume and therefore a normal cardiac output, still get admitted to the hospital with congestion. And in fact, it's no different than the patients with half PEF. And it got me thinking, well, why are they hanging on to salt and water if frankly, cardiac output is preserved? Well, at the end of the day, clinicians define heart failure by the presence of congestion. We see lots of shorter breath people in our clinics, um, but it's not frankly until somebody ends up with Exam, a physical exam uh, evidence of congestion, do we actually call it heart failure? In fact, it usually doesn't come to bear until you've been hospitalized. And in fact, this has been embraced by all of our clinical trials of heart failure, uh, particularly half PEF. You, at the end of the day, have to have some sign of volume overload, whether uh, it's objective uh, by the bedside examination or by a laboratory, for example, an elevated natriuretic peptide level or a hospitalization for congestion. And I just use this uh, example from the TopCat trial, which was uh, now a landmark trial in this uh, discipline, where you can see that in order to get in the trial, you had to have congestion or a history of it. Moreover, congestion is so central to the progression of the disease. This is work from the Get With The Guidelines uh, registry, where you can see what happens to patients, whether you get admitted with HEF-PEF, HEF-REF, or heart failure with better ejection fraction, uh, by the time you get admitted, uh, the outcome is very poor, regardless of the underlying nature of your heart failure. As you can see here, the mortality is 75% at five years, and you can see the heart failure readmission rate um, of 50%, which I think everybody appreciates in this group. So again, this congestion is so central here. So this is the dilemma that I would pose to you. Again, it remains largely unexplained. Although multiple observations and current thinking have suggested heter heterogeneity and multiple mechanisms, I tend to favor being a lumper rather than a splitter uh, as a clinician. And so regardless of mechanism, we have to recognize that HEFPEF is ultimately defined by the clinical consequences of volume overload, heart failure hospitalizations. And here is the part that is a cardiologist that has always mystified me the fundamental cause of sodium and fluid overload, frankly, remains unexplored. So this is the paradigm for which we typically think of congestion, sodium and fluid avidity, and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. There is an identifiable proximal insult to the human heart. There's a fall in LV performance, which then activates neurohormonal mechanisms, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, the sympathetic nervous system, endothelin, and others, which uh, of course leads to in a vicious cycle, more myocardial injury, more remodeling, and symptomatic heart failure. At the same time, these same neurohormones affect the kidney to become sodium and fluid avid. And so central to the syndrome of a heart failure syndrome is that if this paradigm is true in HEF-PEF, we should be able to identify a cardiovascular stimulus for neurohormonal activation. Number two, neurohormonal activation should be present. And then three, antagonism of neurohormonal activation should improve outcomes. Well, is there evidence in HEF-PEF that there is a central stimulus for salt water retention? Um, for example, is there evidence of a low cardiac output uh, or a low SVR, which might drive, for example, uh, uh, high output heart failure? Uh, 
Well, there are a number of data sets out there that have looked at this question. This is work from Barry Borlaug. I want to have the folks concentrate on the last uh, row, cardiac index. Um, you see controls in, in the uh, first column, hypertensive controls in the middle, and HFF patients in the far right. I think you can all appreciate that there is normal resting cardiac uh, output and index. If you look at SVR there in the third row, SVRI, you can also see that they're all comparable. So it's been very difficult, at least from a hemodynamic perspective, to identify to identify uh, a hemodynamic uh, cardiovascular stimulus for salt and water retention. Well, is there evidence for neurohormonal activation? Data sets here are very limited, surprisingly. This is one from John McMurray. This is using the SOLVE database. Everybody recalls SOLVE. This SOLVE was a clinical trial of the use of uh, enalapril to prevent the progression and treatment of heart failure. What you see here are plasma norepinephrine levels and plasma renin activity. Uh, and you have three groups, control in the dark bar. Uh, white bars are the uh, HEF-PEF patients and in the uh, crosshatch bars, patients with HEF-REF. And as you can see, the increase in neurohormonal activation in the middle bars is modest compared to controls. Uh, statistically significant, perhaps, but modest at best. And then I think the biggest distinction is um, how attenuated it is when you compare it to HEF-REF. We've done some work ourselves. This is work that one of my colleagues here at the University of Utah and I did using the Enmeyer data set. This is um, the heart to metastinal ratio for, as a measure of sympathetic activation. Lower, by the way, of this ratio means more activation. Higher of this ratio means less activation. And as you can see, when you compare the small group of HEF-PEF patients in the Enmeyer data set, you can see, again, um, it's all over the place. Number one, I think that's the first thing to appreciate. But number two, uh, on average here, it doesn't appear to be a nearly as um, uh, impressive as a HEF-REF patient. Well, let's get on to the antagonism. If you say, well, maybe it's an issue of the data sets. Maybe there is a lot more neurohormonal activation that we've simply missed. Well, on the flip side of that, antagonizing these pathways should re uh, result in less congestion and less heart failure hospitalizations. Well, every attempt to look at this has been neutral. This is, um, there's been no large scale beta blocker trials, frankly, in true HEFPEF. This is taken from the Swedish Heart Failure Registry where they um, did propensity matching. And I would point you to the, uh, the green dotted and the green solid lines, which are matched cohorts of patients treated with and without beta blockers. And I think you can appreciate there is no difference when you antagonize, uh, at least systemically, um, this syndrome with beta blockers in terms of improving outcomes. How about with renin angiotensin aldosterone um, system antagonists? Well, iPreserve was one of the largest HEFPEF studies to date, more than 4,000 patients. Uh, these patients with HEFPEF were randomized, randomized to herbisartan versus placebo. And as people recall, this trial published in the New England Journal was neutral. But what I'd also like to point you to is the fact that if you look at simply just heart failure hospitalizations as a surrogate for congestion, you can see that there was no impact um, antagonizing this important driver of sodium fluid avidity in patients with heart failure. Maybe you might ask, there was a subgroup we missed. Well, it doesn't really matter how you slice it and dice it, whether you were or were not previously on an ACE inhibitor, whether you were or were not on a beta blockers, maybe whether you had or didn't have diabetes, whether you had a previous hospitalization for heart failure or not. Again, we could not find any benefit. Furthermore, uh, we all know that when the creatinine bumps a little bit, that's actually a good thing typically in heart failure because it represents antagonism of the neurohormonal system. And in many data sets, we do know that when the creatinine bumps have a modest amount, that outcomes are actually better uh, in patients with chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. In contrast, if you look again at the iPreserve data set, the patients who actually have this little bump in uh, creatinine or fall in GFR who were randomized to over certain arm actually did the worst, not the best. And perhaps this is an illustration that uh, antagonizing the system may have uncovered a group of patients who intrinsically had renal dysfunction that was driving uh, perhaps their heart failure. 
So this really begs the question, are we really even talking about heart failure at the end of the day in the traditional sense? Uh, this is a very nice cartoon from Barry Borlaug and Maggie Redfield from almost a decade ago where they put this in perspective in an editorial where they simply looked at the um, benefits of neurohormonal antagonism in HEF-PEF and HEF-RAF cohorts. And as you can see here in blue, that neurohormonal antagonism is uniformly beneficial in patients with HEF-RAF, whereas you can see in red that these uh, strategies are uniformly ineffective in this patient population. Again, begging the question, are we even talking about heart failure in the traditional sense? Well, I put up this uh, really nice um, uh, review article that many of you are familiar with from the New England Journal by Schreier and Abraham uh, uh, about uh, the nature of the cardiorenal syndrome. And why I put this figure up is I would like you to notice the direction of the arrows uh, in this description of the systematic uh, mediators of heart failure. And as you can see, it, it would appear that the uh, kidney is really just living a consequence of everybody else uh, within the system. And um, the idea that actually there are no arrows going outward from the kidney as a uh, initial arbiter of the condition, I think, is telling. And our biases uh, as, cardiology, as cardiologists uh, certainly um, is ubiquitous. This is written by a very good friend of myself and Dr. Hare's. Uh, in the textbook uh, for heart disease. And uh, in the chapter on chronic heart failure, and I took this as a quote, uh, there is little evidence to suggest that a primary renal abnormality is responsible for the excessive sodium retention and heart failure. So again, I, I, you know, the, the deck has been stacked <laughs> in many ways against the kidney in terms of how we think about this condition. So the case I'm trying to set up for you today is that perhaps we've underappreciated the primacy of the kidney in this syndrome. So if sodium and fluidity or lack of its excretion uh, is not being driven by neurohormonal stimulation, which is driven by the heart as a proximal event, then perhaps the kidney must be doing so in quotation marks inappropriately. And perhaps there is a renal disorder at work here. So I'm going to try to make the case over the next few minutes here that there are several lines of circumstantial evidence that point to the uh, kidney driving uh, this syndrome. Uh, number one, renal insufficiency is common to HEFPEF and associated with outcomes. Number two, renal function is inadequately characterized by measures of glomerular filtration, EGFR or serum creatinine, and we'll get into that. It's important to recognize that renal insufficiency can presage HEF-PEF, both in animal models uh, and in um, registry data. Renal insufficiency can mediate cardiovascular dysfunction. I think everybody recognizes this in terms of taking care of patients with advanced CKD. And then I wanna make the case um, also on how important sodium and uh, uh, water overload in and of itself is a tremendous cardiovascular insult. So let's take each of these points one at a time. So there are a lot of data sets that would suggest that this is the issue, uh, that CKD uh, is independently correlated with poor outcomes. And we've known uh, this in HEF-REF, but uh, there are several data sets that have demonstrated this in HEF-PEF. This is data from the Kaiser um, system from, I think, uh, four uh, separate uh, registries within Kaiser. And they looked at, um, retrospectively, at the impact of having CKD, uh, which is a GFR of less than uh, 60 cc's per minute per 1.73 meters squared, compared to those with GFRs higher than that. And as you can see, as the GFR falls, that there is an increase in the hazard ratio uh, in HEF-PEF, and this frankly approaches um, or is very analogous to patients with HEF-REF you see in the far right row here. And many of the data sets would confirm that. Uh, so let's move on to the second point that I'm gonna to try to make, that in both in clinical practice and frankly, uh, as investigators, I think we um, have underappreciated um, the uh, 
the uh, assessment, uh, let's put it that way, of renal function um, uh, in cardiovascular data sets. So renal function is inadequately characterized by measures of glomerular filtration. So to give you an example of this is I took this data from, I took this um, um, a report from uh, Kevin Damon, who's um, in the Netherlands, who examined uh, tubular interstitial marking, uh, biomarkers um, uh, as a surrogate for renal dysfunction independent of the serum creatinine and albuminuria, which of course is a very sensitive marker of renal function. And uh, many people recall just the HF. It was a two by two factorial design trial of um, fish oil uh, and statins and, and heart failure. And what he simply did was look at um, these urinary markers of uh, tubular dysfunction, NGAL, KIM1, and NAG, and compared them to the uh, outcomes of patients who had abnormalities in uh, glomerular function, albuminuria, um, or um, a low GFR. And as you can see, that patients who have these uh, uh, tubular biomarkers in their urine segregated uh, independent of the patients in whom had uh, CKD as measured by GFR or even more sensitive measures of uh, abnormal um, glomerular function albuminuria. There's also um, physiologic data that would suggest this. This study is one of my favorites from Italy. This is a very small study where they took patients with heart failure and simply looked at what happened to their sodium excretion when challenged with sodium. So what they did was uh, sodium uh, load um, normal control subjects um, there in the white bars and patients with mild heart failure in the dark bars. And they measured GFR, renal uh, plasma flow, and renal vascular resistance. And uh, not unexpectedly, the GFR with salt loading goes up and the renal uh, plasma flow goes up as well. Um, and and no, no big surprise, the renal resistive index um, uh, falls in order to accommodate this increase in flow. But what's really interesting here is what ends up happening to the sodium. As you can see in the very top graph, despite the same amount of filtered sodium between normal subjects and the patients with mild heart failure, what you see here is that they don't excrete the sodium and water load that they were given. Um, as you, in contrast, as you see into the white bars, where the function of the kidney is maintained by uh, excreting the water, uh, the potassium, uh, and the salt. And therefore, they concluded that there was a defective adaptation of sodium reabsorption in the proximal nephron, which is the sodium with the sodium retention uh, from increased salt intake and heart failure. And we'll speak more to this later because I think everybody recognizes there is a new class of drug that actually gets that sodium uh, proximal reabsorption in the nephron. We here at Utah have tried to recapitulate this same study, but not in HEF-REF patients, but in HEF-PEF patients. And this is our ARI study. This is a pilot study of a group of patients with HEF-PEF and normal controls in which we give them a sodium load a saline infusion for two hours, um, and then give them a diuretic, and then look at their sodium excretion over the next two hours. And what we have found in our preliminary look at this is perhaps no big surprise that the control subjects are able to excrete the sodium load, but the patients with HEF-PEF are not. And in fact, with this very modest sodium challenge, you can see that the control subjects in general are able to um, maintain their euvolemia but the patients with HEF-PEF were not. We have a number of pending analyses that hope to get more at mechanisms. But again, I think the lesson learned here is that GFR simply underrepresents um, the dysfunction of the kidney when we simply use uh, measures of GFR in both investigation and in clinical practice. Now, of course, it's important um, from a mechanistic point of view that uh, we can demonstrate that uh, creating um, renal dysfunction, either an N model or actually documenting renal insufficiency in prospective registries can presage HEFPEF. Um, I took the liberty of uh, borrowing this uh, uh, example from Drs. Rieger and Hare at the University of Miami. They just published this in PNAS in which they were looking at the impact of uh, growth hormone releasing hormone. Uh, on patients with HEF-PEF. And I only grabbed this example because I think it's a very nice example of a 
uh, renal model of HEF-PEF, what they did is um, did a um, nephrectomy model um, in these Yorkshire pigs. And as you can see from the picture there that they get this sort of um, LVH uh, HEF-PEF appearance to the pigs. And if you see in the table up there, you get uh, the classic findings of HEF-PEF with hypertension, renal insufficiency, uh, anemia um, uh, in this model. And when you hemodynamically study these uh, pigs, they do have FPEF. They have diastolic, diastolic abnormalities with increases in the diastolic pressure. They have um, um, movement of the end diastolic pressure volume relationship up into the left, and they have abnormalities in relaxation. I uh, previously alluded to the fact that there is um, pretty good uh, prospect of circumstantial evidence that renal, insuffic renal insufficiency at baseline presages HEF-PEF even more strongly than HEF-REF. This is work from the PREVEND registry from the Netherlands, where they uh, took 8,592 uh, 8, subjects uh, from a, a town in the Netherlands and prospectively followed them for um, a little bit more than a decade. To get in this registry, you had to have um, a very modest amount of albuminuria. And they looked at a number of traditional risk factors um, taken at baseline in these patient groups and then simply looked at what happened over the ensuing decade. You can see in the first column um, the hazard ratios for these risk factors with respect to HEF-REF. In the second column, you can see the uh, risk factors for HEF-PEF. And I've uh, provided you with an arrow uh, to show you what I want you to concentrate on. In the two measures of um, baseline, uh, all bite, uh, subtle abnormalities in renal, uh, dis uh, in renal function, you can see that cystatin C is a very accurate measure of GFR, tended to predict um, HEF-PEF rather than HEF-RAF, and so did urinary albumin uh, excretion or albuminuria. So again, prospect of registry data that um, it's a very strong risk factor for the development of uh, HEF-PEF is defined by congestion and volume overload. Well, let's take the next point. Renal insufficiency can mediate cardiovascular dysfunction. This is work, um, again, from Northwestern, where they took their HEF-PEF cohort and examined um, the relationship in an independent manner of uh, chronic kidney disease, as you can see along the x-axis here, and abnormalities um, of, um, uh, uh, of myocardial dysfunction. And what they've done here is looked at the left atrial reservoir strain function as a measure of uh, diastolic dysfunction in these patients. And you can see that there is a correlation. There's a lot of overlap here, but this was an independent uh, trend and so there's no doubt that there appears to be a relationship between progressive renal insufficiency and cardiac dysfunction in and of itself. Number two, um, I think people also realize that chronic kidney disease makes blood vessels stiff. And this has been known for some time. Um, but it's also an important reminder uh, for me to um, review the fact that abnormal ventricular vascular coupling is um, very stressful um, on the heart and is arguably one of the pathophysiologic mechanisms for the diastolic dysfunction that we see. Because as blood vessels get stiffer, pulse wave velocity uh, increases and this um, uh, worsens diastolic dysfunction um, in patients with preserved ejection fraction. And so this may be pathophysiologically a very important mediator and connection between uh, chronic kidney disease and half PEF, which you see here on the left, you see uh, aortic distensibility falling as the GFR um, falls um, and uh, correlates nicely with uh, progressive uh, abnormalities in urinary albumin uh, secretion. On the right, you can see this issue uh, presented graphically when you look at pulse wave velocity as a measure of arterial stiffness, a higher pulse wave velocity implies a very stiff uh, blood vessel. And as you can see, as the um, uh, renal function worsens and the CKD severity um, increases, you can see that pulse wave velocity and, and vascular stiffness increase, increases. And uh, this is exacerbated in the patients uh, 
with diabetes, um, who we know also is a very important condition that leads to the stiffening of blood vessels, uh, almost certainly through things like uh, advanced glycation end products. So what are the mediators of CKD um, that um, provide these cardiovascular insults? Well, in addition simply to um, congestion, as we're going to get to, there are a number of putative uh, markers. There are a number of proteonomic analyses that are now being conducted in large cohorts of patients with CKD. It is likely that there are a lot of potential mediators. I've given you a small list of things that have been implicated. Um, antagonizing um, some of these mediators might be a therapeutic strategy. I suspect um, because there are so many mediators that that particular approach may have its limitations, but these are some of the many things that have been um, uh, implicated uh, in driving the cardiovascular dysfunction that we see with CKD. Well, let's start off, then let's uh, conclude with this last comment about the impact of sodium and water overload as a cardiovascular insult in and of itself. Well, when you take blood vessels and you distend them, whether we're talking about arteries or veins, this is a very important and strong stimulus for systemic inflammation, the production of reactive oxidant species, the obviously congestion of the venous system leads to elevated central venous pressures and back pressure uh, in the kidney. Of course, it increases the stiffness of any blood vessel as it becomes more distended we all know the role of volume overload with respect to hypertension. And importantly, it's a very strong stimulus for sympathetic activity, which is a very important mediator of any heart failure syndrome. I'd like to provide you with a couple of, I think, very telling examples of the importance um, of volume overload once it's initiated. So this is uh, one of my, again, favorite studies from uh, Uli Jordi uh, in New York. And this is an issue we see a lot in heart failure. And, and that is, I think, um, something that uh, highlights the consequences of not arterial congestion, but venous congestion, which we see so commonly in clinical practice. And what, they, uh, what these uh, group of investigators did in Uli Jordi's lab was um, blow up a blood pressure cuff to about 30 millimeters of mercury, just enough in these normal volunteers, young, healthy volunteers, by the way, um, to literally congest uh, the forearm, as you can see there, for 75 minutes. And at baseline, they drew blood samples, um, as well as took samples of uh, endothelial cells by passing a wire uh, into the uh, vein. And then they did the same thing 75 minutes later. And what you see as, what you see uh, the consequences uh, of this venous congestion, all by artificially, uh, where you see um, uh, stimulation of uh, inflammatory cytokines such as IL-6 and TNF-alpha, as well as endothelin-1. Uh, you see endothelial activation as measured by VCAM expression. And um, you see measures of um, neurohormonal activation with angiotensin II. So the, just the uh, passive congestion of the veins is a, a very important systemic inflammatory uh, and uh, oxidative stimulus for the entire systemic circulation. And of course, the heart and the kidneys are going to see the consequences of that systemic inflammation. We should also remind ourselves that uh, congestion and, uh, and salt overload produce in and of itself abnormalities to the glomerulus. This is an animal model um, of HEFPEF created by uh, uh, nephrectomizing um, these animals. And what you see here are um, uh, histologies of the glomerulus with uh, sham and normal saline loading, sham and high salt loading, a unifractorized animal in the lower left, a unifractomized animal in the mid lower middle in the middle lower panel with a high salt diet, and then a rescue uh, by giving a dapamide. And I think everybody can appreciate there in the middle bottom, which is in pink there, that that glomerulus is small, shrunken, and scarred. And this is graphically and quantitatively represented on the far right, 
and that that could be rescued by simply decongesting the animal with an endapamide. So another consequence of chronic salt and volume overloading. We see this actually with respect to the heart too. This is the salt sensitive dull rat, which of course is inappropriately hanging on to sodium. This is work from Dan Burkhoff and Matt Maurer from a, many years ago. And as you can see, that simply salt loading these animals with salt sensitive hypertension in the upper right panel produces a shift over uh, of the end diastolic pressure volume relationship up and to the left, e.g. a stiffer heart uh, within 12 weeks. Now over the course of 20 weeks, uh, you see that there is um, remodeling of the heart. But again, another example of, cardio of the cardiac consequences of simply too much salt. Well, this is all fine and dandy. You might say, you know, well, so what? You've convinced me the kidney is important and we've all known that from clinical practice. What are really the therapeutic implications at the end of the day? Uh, I always like to joke that, you know, sometimes uh, one of the reasons I, I love nephrology, but one of the reasons that I found it challenging was at the time uh, I decided what to become, that there were not a lot of therapeutic interventions. Well, that has changed dramatically and I'm gonna to get to that in just a moment. So um, what are the therapeutic implications? Uh, number one, we should control sodium and fluid avidity. Number two, preventing or slowing renal dysfunction is critical. And in addition to controlling blood pressure and using RES antagonists, we have other strategies. And then finally, it's important to remember that organs are just part of a neighborhood. Um, and uh, sometimes it's the neighborhood or the systemic milieu that these organs sit in that should be perhaps the target of our interventions. So this issue of just controlling salt and water um, overload really um, has not only been talked about, but we know from randomized trials um, can improve uh, things like uh, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, and cardiovascular functioning. This is one example. Uh, this is a small study from Scott Hummel, who took a group of 13 patients with HEF-PEF, all who had evidence of uh, volume congestion, and subjected them to a DASH diet uh, for 21 days. They strictly controlled the diet for these three weeks. 50 millimoles, by the way, is a uh, half of what we currently recommend uh, in terms of sodium restriction uh, for the public. So this is not a trivial sodium restriction. But as you can see, over simply the course of just three weeks, you can see the improvement in blood pressure, uh, pulse wave velocity as a surrogate measure for aortic stiffness, uh, and oxidant stress as measured by uh, isoprostanes in the urine. You see the increase in urinary aldosterone, which is really just a representation of the severity of the salt restriction. So, you know, there's a lot of evidence that sodium and fluid restriction is very important in these patients. We took this one step further by looking at the role of spironolactone in terms of its impact on sodium and fluid balance in patients in the TopCat trial. This is work we published uh, last year and what we did is we said to ourselves, you know, spironolactone at the end of the day is a diuretic. We should not forget that. It's a modest diuretic, and many people know that some patients really respond dramatically, but most do not. But perhaps it's working in a synergistic way with loop diuretics. And what you can see here in the upper uh, left is that despite uh, um, uh, no difference um, in the changes in weight between uh, patients in the spironolactone or placebo arms, what you see there in the far lower right-hand panel is that it did appear to have a loop sparing effect when you look at the diuretic doses. It didn't necessarily um, in the upper right-hand panel suggest that you could get off a loop diuretic completely, but it certainly would appear that you needed to use loop, less loop diuretic uh, in the patients who were uh, randomized to the spironolactone arm. And in fact, using adjuvant thiazide diuretics to achieve a naturesis was also found to be less in the spironolactone arm as you see in the panel on the lower left. And then of course, a lot has been made out of this observation. Uh, this is a post hoc examination of the CardiMEMS trial. CardiMEMS is a, a modest study of 550 patients with class three heart failure who had an implantable um, a monitor that measured PA pressures. Some people call it the ambulatory Swan-Gans catheter. Uh, 
uh, and by um, aggressively managing uh, congestion using this implantable device, you could keep patients with hep, hep out of the hospital. So again, a lot of circumstantial evidence of just managing um, um, salt and uh, fluid restriction um, has an impact on this condition. And we shouldn't forget that diuretics um, have other effects that are perhaps independent of their sodium and fluid uh, effects. This is um, frankly old work um, from more than 20 years ago that simply looks at the impact of different classes of blood pressure medicines according to their pulse pressure. A lower pulse pressure is, of course, better than a higher pulse pressure, which would imply a very stiff blood vessel. As you can see here in the uh, left bars that hydrochlorothiazide had the biggest impact on the uh, pulse pressure when compared to other drugs. And we talked earlier about the importance of um, vascular stiffness and the pathophysiology of FPEF. Well, ultimately, can we frankly just prevent or slow renal dysfunction in the first place if we're talking about that as the primary mediator? Well, <clears throat> we know aldosterone um, is a very important uh, uh, neurohormone to antagonize. Um, there's a lot of evidence that not only does it make um, the heart and the blood vessels um, stiffer, but uh, also um, produces renal fibrosis uh, and renal injury over time. And when you look in the TopCat trial, and, and what I've done for you here is giving you various tables of the hazard ratios according to uh, urinary albumin excretion as very subtle measures of renal dysfunction, you can see that there is a linear relationship between uh, worsening renal uh, dysfunction as measured by albuminuria and uh, outcome. And very importantly, spironolactone was associated with a reduction of the albuminuria by 40%, arguably a way to slow the progression of the renal insufficiency. The effect was larger with greater baseline albuminuria Reducing albuminuria also translated into a reduction in heart failure hospitalizations and all-cause mortality. And very importantly, this could not be explained simply by a reduction in systolic blood pressure as the mediator of uh, the attenuation of um, progressive renal insufficiency. Importantly, <clears throat> if we go back to the ALHAT trial, one of the largest hypertension trials ever conducted, almost 30,000 patients randomized to chlorthalidone, lisinopril, amlodipine, and prazosin, the alpha blocker. What's fascinating here is chlorthalidone, there in the solid bar, in contrast to the other two arms seen here, lisinopril and amlodipine, um, was the only intervention that appeared to prevent the progression of incident HEF-PEF Again, uh, more uh, evidence that uh, controlling um, uh, sodium and fluid uh, status um, is important. I should tell you there, ha there has been subsequent analyses that would suggest that the impact of chlorthalidone and even lisinopril on the progression of renal dysfunction was in fact the mediator of this observation that I just showed you. And of course, uh, we have even better drugs um, with less adverse events that can hopefully slow the progression of renal dysfunction. This is the Fidelio DKD trial published in the New England Journal um, just this uh, year. And the premise here was the uh, non-steroidal um, third generation MRA called phenerenone could slow the progression of CKD and diabetes. And in this particular trial of almost 6,000 patients, you can see that those patients who are at high risk for disease progression, um, in fact, uh, could have their uh, progressive renal dysfunction attenuated uh, by this intervention. The primary endpoint here was a renal endpoint of uh, end-stage kidney disease, renal death, or a fall in GFR. And importantly, this translated also into a reduction in cardiovascular events. And again, prospectively addressing the issue that if we can keep the kidneys happy, we're gonna keep the rest of you happy too. And importantly, it did appear at least to have a trend toward keeping people out of the hospital. Well, um, in the last five minutes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about sodium glucose co-transporter type two inhibitors. Um, this of course has been um, an amazing story, um, a drug that uh, has many ubiquitous effects, but I should recall and remind people that this particular co-transporter is primarily seen in the kidney. <laughs> 
Uh, you can certainly find this co-transporter in other places, at least the type 1 transporter you can find in the gastrointestinal tree, but the transporter 2 is pretty much confined to the kidney. And in fact, we do know by antagonizing this co-transporter, uh, which transports both glucose and sodium, that uh, we not only introduce a glycosuria, but a naturesis. And in fact, by interrupting things like glomerular, uh, tubular glomerular feedback is that we can slow the progression of renal insufficiency through a number of mechanisms you can see there in the pink box. And the hypothesis that this class of drug could slow the progression of CKD um, is being tested in a number of clinical trials. This is the most recently uh, presented one, Credence. Um, well, actually, not most recently. This is 2019, almost two years old. But in this particular tri uh, trial, patients um, who are at high risk of uh, diabetic uh, nephropathy progression and cardiovascular outcomes were randomized um, to canagliflozin versus placebo. Now, all of these patients were on background RAS antagonism. As you can see, using the primary endpoint, renal endpoint in the far left here, you can see that canagliflozin did, in fact, uh, uh, attenuate the progression of uh, CKD, and on the right, concomitantly reduced uh, cardiovascular outcomes and slowed the progression of uh, the fall in GFR. This, of course, has resulted in um, the Deliver HF trial, which is one of many trials testing the hypothesis that um, protecting the kidney and, and improving the environment may, in fact, have an impact on HEF-PEF, uh, particularly if HEF-PEF is a condition that I'm trying to make a case as a renal cardio syndrome rather than a cardiac syndrome. Well, finally, from a therapeutic implication point of view, perhaps what we should really be targeting is the systemic environment that the heart and kidney sit in. This is a cartoon I put together for a grant um, that don't forget the heart and kidney live in this comorbidity driven inflammatory milieu that's impacted by genetic influences and gender related factors. And they are independently affected and they communicate perhaps with each other through vascular, bloodborne, and autonomic pathways. And that, of course, uh, we would love to, you know, address the big blue circle rather than simply these mediating pathways as the best way to get at this. And um, this is a cartoon really that says just the same, that all of these comorbidities that you see along the top, obesity, uh, renal insufficiency, diabetes, all lead to systemic inflammation, microvascular dysfunction, uh, decreases in uh, NO bioavailability. And you not only get myocardial remodeling and dysfunction, but you get renal uh, remodeling and dysfunction. Uh, and of course, uh, this is perhaps best brought to light from the Paragon trial. The Paragon trial is a trial of Sucubitrol Valsartan versus placebo in patients with HEF-PEF. And everybody recalls the p-value here was 0.06 for the endpoint of heart failure hospitalization and CV death. And it was recently approved by the FDA for the management of patients um, with HEF-PEF with mildly uh, reduced ejection fraction. And keep in mind that this primarily worked by keeping people out of the hospital. But I would tell you this is an intervention that is really not uh, directed necessarily at the heart or the kidneys, but really the systemic um, availability of uh, nitric oxide in its pathway. And I should also importantly keep in my, uh, remind myself as well as everybody on the call that it really had no impact unfortunately on overall cardiovascular or total mortality. There was a slight hint that um, the renal composite was also benefited as another um, uh, signal that the kidney is very important in this role, but these were small numbers. So to conclude, you know, um, and maybe we have a little time for questions. Um, you know, I like to think of uh, HEF-PEF not as a cardiorenal syndrome, but more of a renocardio syndrome. You know, we clearly see patients with both of these issues. And, uh, you know, certainly the patients with, you know, what I would call the purest form of diastolic dysfunction or HEF-PEF, which is a restrictive cardiomyopathy like amyloid. I think you'd see those patients on the far left. And then, yeah, I think their salt and fluid retention is being driven by the kidney, but there are patients on the far right of course, who have very bad renal insufficiency that are really driving the volume overload. Of course, what we see are patients in the middle and how to tease them out, I think is very difficult. Um, I've been on this campaign for a while now 
Um, but this is a paradigm I've put together. This is really a vicious cycle. And although as a cardiologist, we've been concentrating on that organ at the bottom, you know, I think it's high time that we pay much more attention as cardiologists to this issue of how impaired renal dysfunction is really driving this vicious cycle. And we all know this, that we all see life from our point of view. Uh, and as a cardiologist on the left or on the right, <laughs> depending upon your point of view, that it's really time to understand that we're talking about a systemic disorder. And we have to, at some level, figure out why, right? There is volume and sodium retention. So to conclude, the cause of volume overload in HEPF is not clear. In contrast to HEPF, neurohormonal activation is not universal in HEPF. Volume overload may be a consequence of a primary renal disorder that we're simply not yet able to tease out at the bedside. HEFPEF could be part of a renal cardiac vicious cycle. And I think we actually have the tools now to suggest and to target renal insufficiency as the driver of this syndrome. So I want to thank everybody for attending my talk here on a on a Wednesday, uh, I guess it's noon there, it's 10 o'clock here, and of course a shout out to my great division that gives me the opportunity and the time to talk with you all. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fang, that was an excellent Grand Rounds and really opened our eyes to a paradigm to think about. Um, I also wanna welcome the Salzburgs as well and thank them for their generosity making this possible and Dr. Hare for inviting you as well. So um, we don't have much time for questions and this may be a little bit naive, but if um, we had sufficient numbers of HEFPEF patients that had severe kidney dysfunction and actually went for renal transplant, what is the outcome of those patients after renal transplant in terms of their congestion? Yeah, that, Dr. Wise, that's a fantastic question. I was, I was going to show you some data, actually. We do know, actually, at least in HEF-REF, that when you transplant the kidney in HEF-REF, actually, ejection fraction goes up. Um, so, yeah, so if you transplant somebody with an ejection fraction of 30 40%, who you otherwise think could do well, there's lots of observational data to show that those patients, the ejection fraction goes up. We also know from clinical experience, and I think the nephrologists on the call probably know this, is you don't tend to see a lot of HEFPEF after renal transplant, frankly, particularly if they had been having challenges with volume overload before the renal transplant. Now, there have not been detailed studies of diastolic dysfunction, uh, post-renal transplant, but I suspect we'd see the same issue that we see in HEFREF. But great question. Thank you. Well, we'll be mindful of the hour and uh, wish you well and safe tidings in uh, Utah. And we welcome you to Miami anytime you want to come. So uh, <laughs> you have a, a rain check for sure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your time. time. Thank you, Jim. And we'll see you at, uh, in a few hours. All righty. Bye-bye. Thank you very much to the Saltzman family. Thank you.